Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. Hey, welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast. Yes, this is the podcast where we empower you, the filmmaking entrepreneur. And a great way to get started is to get the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion while doing it. It's available in paperback, Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. And in fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. All right. Hey, guys. Well, I'm actually joined today again um, with Ron Newcomb, who's uh, going to be, you're going to hear his voice more and more often down the line. But Ron Newcomb is the indie film coach at indiefilmcoach.com. Hey, why don't you say hi, Ron? Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, eager to uh, jump in and give a hand and help some people out with some filmmaking. So we were talking earlier off air, but tell me, tell the audience a little bit about like the uh, interview you just did earlier and what's to come in, in the future episodes of the Film Trooper podcast. Yeah, super excited about this one. I mean, this guy feels like a homegrown film trooper, you know, <laughs> right out the gate. He's one of us. And yet he is definitely at this second tier level. Uh, it is the filmmaker Eduardo Sanchez. Most of us will know him by his work of Blair Witch. Yeah. And so that sent him on a trajectory down the path of predominantly directing. He's doing a lot of directing these days in the TV space. And so we got into talking about uh, Blair Witch and the making of, as well as, I don't know if you recall, the marketing around Blair Witch was just fantastic. And it was right when websites i mean mm -hmm. films didn't even have websites at that time really so yeah. it was right at that time and he gets into the marketing of that and then the application of that uh you know really reigning true of stories still king no matter what and that obviously will dictate and help the marketing but then we do get into his filmmaking path of how he leveled up and then has worked on shows like supernatural I mean, how do you walk on to a show <laughs> with that much history? They're in their 13th season. Yeah. Like his first one that he walked in on, it was like episode 239 or something crazy. Oh, how wow. do you come in outside and actually go in and make a difference? And so he gets into a little bit of that as well. It was, it was really cool. That's going to be, I'm excited to listen to that one because, um, Love Blair Witch. I love what they did as well as, uh, my family and I are huge supernatural fans. We actually went to a supernatural like conference like a separate like people go to comic cons and things like that but yeah my family and i actually went to a weekend long just specifically supernatural and nice. my daughter had drawn uh these uh drawings like she's pretty good as an artist and she drew drawings of the uh the stars families so when she met jared padlecki you know oh, cool. he, he she had drawn a drawing of uh um, him and his wife and their and their children and it and it was awesome to see how much he embraced it, embraced her, yeah. and, and and asked for her autograph. And he took a lot of t he took a lot of time hanging out, um, you know, spending time that interchange with my daughter. And so for now, he's like our favorite just because of just how yeah. genuinely awesome he is in person. But anyway, it was an amazing weekend. Okay. We can jump right into this episode's title, which is essentially um, how do you get named actors and work with SAG for your indie film? So we actually have two guests today. You'll hear my interviews with them. But I, I normally, you know, will have like an interview with like one guest and that will run like 45 to an hour long. But I wanted to really just focus in on this uh, topic, the subject matter. But this mm -hmm. is actually part one. Because I have part two where I interview uh, another uh, independent film director in New York and the head of SAG Indie. So uh, I'll combine those two together for part two. So for today, um, we'll listen to part one. And part one is um, the first guest you'll hear is uh, my interview with Kelsey Tucker, who's a friend of mine here in Portland. Um, we're actors. We were, we're acting together in a bunch of jobs up here. But I remember she was in the in the kind of just the beginning stages of this wanting to fund and cr make this independent American comedy. And um, I had a long dinner with her one night, you know, her and her husband, and just kind of told her what I knew about my experiences in the industry as well, Film Trooper. And then you're going to hear a little bit about how she took some of that advice, and she went ahead and made this independent American comedy, 
with uh, Thor Birch and Chris Klein from uh, Man, American Pies. Nice. Yeah, so it's uh, you'll hear how she did it. So, with that said, let's um, you know, um, let's jam right in. But oh wait, yeah, let's jump in. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Here we go. It's so it's so funny, but you're you're a big part of this story, and I bring this part I bring this part of the story up all the time when people ask me how did the movie come together, how did you make it happen, and um, it always starts with, well, first I took a lot of people a lot a lot of filmmakers to lunch, a lot of Portland filmmakers to lunch, and yeah. I asked a lot of questions, and you know that's just I brought a pad of paper and I asked questions. I think you and I ran into each other right around that time when yeah. I was very, very early in trying to figure out how, you know, how to get this thing off the ground. And your advice was, you should go to AFM purely as a learning vehicle. <laughs> so when I'm telling this story, I say, somebody told me I should go to AFM and, and try to set some meetings before I go down there, right? With right. people just right. on the strength of my script and, and my synopsis. And, you know, glean these people for information about what would make my film marketable, what would make it um, something that they, who are the ultimate buyers, right, or the sales reps for the buyers, right. um, would find attractive and want to represent and want to sell. Um, and that was such great advice. It really was. Um, we, we, we were able to set up the meetings, like I said, by because um, you, you get your badge at AFM. Yep. And then you've got... Uh, you've got access to all of their information online. You know, most yeah. of the time, all of these email addresses to all these people that you'd like to get in touch with are, are hidden and yeah, yeah, yeah. almost impossible to find, right? Um, but when you have your badge, suddenly you've got access to all these people and you can, you can email them and you can basically solicit a meeting, you know, yeah. which, is, which is what I did. And I was able to, I was able to set up, I think I had eight meetings um, at AFM uh, with different... Um, companies, sales reps. That's great. Yeah. That is great for like a brand new coming out of the gate. But you're doing it right because you actually took the time to set it up prior. Because right. most people just show up and like they try to wing it. Right. I got to give I got to give you credit because I think you you actually were the one who told me to do that. You said get in touch with them ahead of time, have your meeting set up ahead of time. Um, and so yeah, that totally paid off because then I wasn't just some person wandering the halls, you know, knocking on doors. I actually had meetings set up. And, and the information I got was invaluable. Um, we, we, and particularly about cast, because yeah. our movie was romantic, is a romantic comedy. Um, that genre we learned is very difficult to sell unless you have to name actors in your male female lead, right? The right. people who are actually falling in love should be name actors that people recognize, and when they're scrolling through their options, they recognize those faces and they know those actors and they want to see the movie. Other genres don't need that, right? The yeah. horror genre doesn't nope. matter, right? Um, thrillers, that kind of thing, they don't, they don't need that. But the romantic comedy genre definitely does. So we came away from AFM, um, my executive producer came down with me as well, and so we came away from that and realized that we'd have to adjust the budget accordingly so that we could <laughs> actually bring in these name actors, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to talk dollars with you guys, that's all, we can say it's, that's all confidential. It's, yes, it's all, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> More than all you need to know is probably is more than ten thousand dollars and less than a million. Right, right so somewhere in there. Right, right. <laughs> so we did. We made some adjustments to the budget so that we were able to um, bring in some name actors. Yeah. Yeah. So um, from there, I was introduced to in order to in order to get the cast that I needed. After we adjusted the budget, I had to have a LA casting director, right? Um, because yeah. I thought at the time that that would be necessary um, in order to get those meetings, right? To, to get mm -hmm. in contact with somebody like Thor Birch. But anyway, I, I was um, fortunate enough to be introduced to Ricky Masler, who is an outstanding um, LA casting director and has been doing it for, for a very long time, has great connections. And she and I met for lunch at AFM um, and uh, started talking about the movie. And did, you, did, you, did you seek her out prior to, uh, or to did AFM? you bump into her? How did that work out? You know, I, 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 she was introduced to me over email um, okay. from my friend Peter Holden, who I grew up with. We've known each other since we were three, and he's been living in L.A. since he graduated from high school. So he's a producer and an actor, and, and he um, had been cast in some movies that Ricky had cast. Um, so he, he knew her personally, and so he introduced me to her, and she very sweetly said, any friend of Peter's is a friend of mine, Aww. and read the script and really liked it, you know. 
that's kind of the starting point, and I'm sure you've covered this in, in many, many of your podcasts, but the, the script has to be solid before you start any of these <laughs> meetings. It's right. got to be solid because they're only going to read it once, right? And yeah. if it's not any good, they're not going to take you seriously. So we had spent a long time developing our script before we did any of this, so it was a very solid script. Um, so anyway, yeah, she read it, and she liked it and wanted to help me out. So, yeah, that happened before. Oh, okay, okay. Before AFM. I uh, gotcha. And so then we had set up a lunch when we were going to be down there. I see, yeah. And, um, and then during that lunch, you know, because we had had the meetings, and we were already thinking about a couple of names, and we actually threw some names out yeah. during, the, during those meetings with the sales reps, you know. What do you think about, you know, Mina Savari? What do you think about this person? What do you think about right. that person? So when I went to the lunch with... Um, Ricky, we're sitting there. It was kind of impressive, really. She's like, so who do you have in mind? I'm like, well, yeah, I think Thora Birch might be um, really great for this. She picks up her phone. She's like, well, let me just call her manager. Like, sitting there, <laughs> had him in her freaking speed dial and, and calls Michael Adler and, and, you know, just as we're sitting right there, pitches the story to him and, and he says, yeah, send the script over. So and I, was, I was sitting there stunned with my jaw kind of like, was that easy? You know, she's going to read my script, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, a, it's about having the right casting director who's got those relationships, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then also doing some brainstorming yourself. Because you know your story better than anybody, right? right. So the, the, I you know, didn't just pull Thora's name out of the air. I mean, I, she was really a, an ideal Lauren, right? So, um, so when she read the script, she really identified with the material, right? Mm -hmm. And um, really liked uh, the independent person that, that Lauren Malden is and how beautifully um, misguided she is, right? She really believes in what she's doing, but she's also sort of, you know, a misguided person, right? Um, right, right. So she's a flawed per you know, flawed characters are, are the most interesting, <laughs> obviously. So she, um, she asked to meet me for lunch after that, and, you know, I was just thrilled that she liked the script and wanted to meet me for lunch. And so I flew down to LA again, and we met uh, for lunch with with her um, manager, and she gave me great script notes. Who were you with, just yourself or your executive producer? Uh, so we met at, on the, uh, the Rally Studios where yeah. Ricky Masler's offices are, okay. and we met at the restaurant that they have there. So yeah, she gave me great script notes that um, tightened it up and, and made the, you know, the competition element of the movie happen in act one instead of, you know, instead of midway through the movie, which ah. really propelled the action, Get it going. you know, into, yeah, yeah. It, she just, she helped tighten it up and make it a better script. So I appreciated that. And, um, so then it was just a matter of finding our male lead. And of course, once you're able to say, you know, this is a Thora Birch project yeah. that got a lot easier and people were reading it and interested in it. Did you guys do like in a formal sort of attachment letter or how did you go about like... No, the, you know, she didn't sign anything um, and, and I, I don't think we asked her to, right? It was just more of a, well, you know, good luck to you. This is, it's, you got a good script here. We'd love to do it. You know, um, let me know how it goes kind of thing, right? And so um, when I say I... I, I we, it wasn't officially a Thor Birch project, right? It wasn't, right, right, right. but we could certainly say that Thor was interested in, in uh, playing yeah. the lead, and um, we were looking for our male lead, um, it, which is what we did. And and then because uh, anybody can call back to the manager and just verify is this absolutely. true, and they were like, yeah, yeah, we met, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. She just confirmed that we've met and that right. she's interested. Basically, is as far yeah. as it went at that point. Yeah, she hadn't signed anything. Um, and then I'm trying to remember how we got Chris Klein. Um, I'm a huge fan of Chris Klein's. Of course. Love his movies <laughs> and just think that he is, you know, not only is he this tall, handsome guy, but he's really good at comedy. Oh, like, yeah. he, it just, it, it's just a natural thing for him. And so. Um, just Friends is one of my favorite films. Yeah. Like that, you know, um, you, you know with stuff. Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, and, and his yeah, yeah. was crazy. Ricky sent him the script and he read it and. Again, it came back. It came back to the script for him. He he said that he really he really loved the dialogue um, in the script, and that he really wanted to say these words. I remember him saying, you know, when when something's written well, the actor really gets to enjoy saying these words. You know, so <laughs> that was a great compliment. But um, it's it, it was a. Uh, that's what got him interested. So then, once we had those guys attached, we were able to wrap up the final details on our funding. Yeah. And. Um, get the thing rolling. So Claire Coffey was just, because she was just working up here in Grimm. So that, yeah, uh, so those are some of those supporting characters yeah. that I was telling you about, you know, although really she's, she's got a, a very big part in the movie. Um, uh, 
she's the sister, right? Yeah. So she's a very she's a very big character in the movie. So you have what we can learn from this is like one, the, the script has to be solid yeah. because all this stuff is like you can meet, meet, meet. All right, send me the script. If the script is like they go, oh my god, this is horrible. Uh, we're gonna pass. Like I cannot see any of our clients ever I might be associated with this. So it has to be, you know, enough to get to the next conversation. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And. Uh, like I said, they're only going to read your script once, and they're only going to take you seriously once, right? And if you deliver a crappy script, I, I wouldn't have gotten past the first conversation with Ricky if it was a crap. Yeah. She wouldn't have represented me, even though she, Peter loves me and she loves Peter. She'd right, be right, like, right. I'm sorry, but your script sucks. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she wouldn't have her reputation it. would be on the line, Her too. reputation's yeah. on the line. Everybody's reputation's on the line, right? So they're only going to show up to a meeting if it's good material, for sure. Right. Let me ask you about, because I've been down this road once before myself, um, where does the, um, like, because usually with a casting director, like the manager will ask, like, okay, you, you're, we have the relationship, that's great, let's take a look at it, but do, do they ever want to know, like, where the financials are, or do they want to know, like, oh, hey, where's, is this coming from private equity, or equity, is this being, or is this, sorry, pre-sales, or anything else like that, uh, did those conversations come up in terms of the, just to, yeah, you, you know, we were talking about real yeah. estate earlier. You know, that, that whole concept of like sometimes you got to vet a buyer or seller to make yeah. sure that, you know, the, the, the loan they're approved for, they're yeah. really approved for, that kind of thing. You know, um, I think at, at the most they will ask for proof of funding, which is a, a pretty simple matter. You can get a letter from your bank manager mm -hmm. saying that the production company has X amount of dollars. And that usually suffices. You know, they don't need to see a copy of your bank statement or anything that serious. But just a, a proof of funding letter um, yeah, like is, you, is yeah. simple. Yeah. Cool. Because that's something that a lot of independent filmmakers try to figure out, like the chicken before the egg. Like, I can't get the funding unless I have, like, a, a name talent attached yeah. to it. But you were like, you know what? You've been building it for this for a while. So you, there was, you know, a yeah. fund that you created and you built and you, you put together. This is, but you said like after the FM experience, it's like we got to adjust this and we right. have to up it or whatever we might do. Because we're like, if we're going to be real players in this, we're going to make it happen. Right. You have to do what you have to do to make that work. And then now you're coming from a place of professionalism where a lot of independent filmmakers just don't. You probably saw it at AFM. You're like, oh, there's a lot of wackadoos here, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was nuts. There were a lot of wackadoos there. Um, but, you know, hey, we're all storytellers. Yeah, we're yeah. all filmmakers. Um, and I was probably one of those wackadoos. Um, you know, it is hard. The chicken before the egg thing is, is, is a re recurring theme in filmmaking, you know, um, and certainly budget and who you're able to cast are one of the places where that takes place. Um, and there's different ways to fund your movie, which I'm sure you've talked about. Yeah. For me, you know, we had a primary um, group of, of early investors, and then we had one primary um, executive producer who was our final investor. And we were able to um, get all of that in place in time to show the proof of funding that we needed. So it, d it didn't become an issue for us. Yeah. Yeah. No. When I saw what you had, you you were much more ahead of the game than most filmmakers. Oh, well, thank you, know? you. Like I was like, okay, so that's. <laughs> but it sounded like you were you were kind of stuck at that moment of like, well, what do we do? Do I go local? Do I do big? Yeah. I mean, that kind of stuff. Like you know what? That, I thought that was the fun part because I didn't I didn't expect to see you there because I remember mentioned I, when we bumped into each other was like, just don't listen to me. Go to the market. Ask the professionals, the people that are actually going to buy your film, what they really were want from you. So you didn't think I was going to take your advice? No, no, no. You, you no. were surprised to see me there? I was surprised that I was there. Like, I, I, I showed up because it was sort of like, I happened to be in town, and then I was just like, okay, I'm there. And I was just, just at a happy hour, you know? I fully expected you to be there. You, oh, were, the, you, you were the reason I was there. So then I looked over, there you were. I'm like, what the hell was Anyway, so uh, it was really great to see. It and But I guess sense there was excitement because it's like, I am learning so much. I'm, yeah, you, I we see like the do, the dots were connecting. You're like, okay, I see how yeah. we've got to position this. And then I, and then you know, I just been following you on Facebook. You know, our friends, and then all of a sudden I see you got the, your actors in place. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's fantastic! Yay! So I remember you were pinching yourself. I think there was like a, a Facebook post of like just sitting back, film is you know got wrapped, put in the can per se. You worked all these amazing people. You're working with uh, this name cast, and you're just yeah. like my script like this is actually ha this happened you yeah. know like I, I thought it was a really cool moment yeah. I read so <laughs> yeah no there is you know a wonderful feeling um, wrapping a movie that you've worked so hard to put together and produce particularly if you were the writer and you get to see these incredible actors saying your words right and bringing these characters to life and they bring you know their own little thing to it so it's really no longer 
your words, no. they become their words, right? Yeah. And they become their care. And, and you just get to see this game, it, you know, it breathe it, it, they breathe it into life. And it's just, you know, I could get all weepy about it, really, because it's one of the most amazing feelings in the world to see that happening. And to, and to see the work be as good as you, as you could have ever hoped that it would be, right? I mean, these guys, they just knocked it out of the park. They, oh, were, right. they were incredible together. They, he was so Calvin, she was so Lauren. I mean, they were perfect in those characters. And then Claire Coffey, man, she just she blew, <laughs> she blew us away. She was incredible as Gina. So the whole thing really, I just got lucky. I'm, I'm pinching myself right now at how lucky I am with the cast that I got. They were incredible. And David Blue is Jacob. Oh my God, <laughs> hysterical. He's just he's so hysterical. Where are you now with the film? I know it's in post production, but what uh, what's uh, what's remaining to? So we. Um, we wrapped post production recently, and um, we are now um, meeting with distributors um, and trying to decide who the best uh, distributor will be for the picture. Um, and then, of course, we're also meeting with sales um, reps to represent us in the foreign markets. Yeah. Yeah. So those are just initial meetings. They're just like. Um there are some offers that are on the table, yeah. actually. Yeah. We're yeah, considering I'm sure. we're considering yeah. some offers at this point, but. Um, no decisions have been made. It's pretty exciting because, like I said, you've you've done it the right. In, if you're playing in that world, like in terms of the, with the, I have a friend that works in that world. He calls it indie Hollywood. You know, so it's all the film the film markets around the world. You know, um, and I'm going to be talking to him on Thursday for the podcast. But anyway, so he's mentioning like this this yeah this concept of like do it right. You know you know your genre. You put the a cast in place, name cast in place that fits that genre. Because it'd be different if you tried to get a romantic romantic comedy and you had a bunch of like, like gnarly action stars. You're like, this seems off. Like I don't, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, but with with Chris Klein and Thor Birch, that's yeah. that's a really cute pairing. Oh, so you know what I so mean? Cute. So yeah. like putting that together, and then you're like, boom, hands done. We finish it. Here it is in post. Now we get to shop it and yeah. have our meetings and everything from a distributor's point of view or a sales rep is like. Great. Somebody who knows the genre they're in, knows you know the people they put in place, so it makes our job a hell of a lot easier to figure out where to take this and wh what we can do with it. Yeah, so. that's what we've been hearing in our meetings, which is gratifying. That you know the time that we took to uh, to get it all put together and packaged together the way that it is is, is paying off. Yeah. So I have to say congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to show it to you. I can't wait to show it to Portland. Portland's yes. gonna be really proud. We did um, a movie that. Is we always thought in our minds it was like a sleepless in Seattle, only it was a post postcard to Portland kind right, of thing, right. right? And we just really highlighted everything that makes Portland beautiful and and strange and and I think I think Portlanders and I think the whole country actually the whole world <laughs> are going to love my movie. <laughs> Damn it! Well, that was great about it because you were like, I wrote a movie. I'm we're gonna produce this movie. I'm going to bring up, yeah, you know, L.A. talent to come yeah. in, but it doesn't matter because I get to choose and we get to shoot here. Right. Well, that's, yeah, so that's, well, that's another piece, and I don't know if you want to cut this out, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, people, you know, you get incentives, tax incentives to shoot in different places, and right. there's also just the convenience factor. So we, we hired an L.A. director because I have no experience in filmmaking, and I definitely needed somebody who had a ton of experience, and so that's how we got Harvey Lowry who has 30 years in the business and has mm -hmm. directed multiple films. And um, so he was the guy, he was my man on the ground is what I say, because he's the one who knew what was going on, you know, knew, knew how to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so there, was, there were questions about, do we have to shoot in Portland? You know, maybe we can shoot here or maybe we can shoot there. And I really held firm with everybody that, no, this is going to be a Portland movie. We're going to shoot. Because one of the things I wanted to do was show that you can make a great movie in Portland, right? Yeah. I, wanted, I want to bring more business here. I want people to realize what... And my crew was 90%, you know, 95% yeah. um, local Portland dudes. And, and then casting as well. Like I said, we did some Portland casting. I really wanted most of my cast to be the local actors that I know are really great up here, right? Yeah. And so um, Portland and Seattle casting, man. We got a lot of local, lo local people to show up. I have a part in the movie as well. <laughs> and we did a great job. So so cool. Like, yeah, I'm just I'm stoked for you. Really stoked for Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> and that's it. Yay! So yeah, that concludes my interview with Kelsey Tucker. And um, be on the lookout for her film, The Competition. Or uh, they might. The, you never know. The titles might change. I remember the early versions of her title was The Pig Theory. It became The Competition. It may change again, uh, depending on what happens before it hits the market. But I don't know. What did you think, Ron? 
Yeah, no, definitely very insightful. Uh, I've gone to AFM uh, myself, and it can be overwhelming. And in truth, though, I don't hear a lot of really slam dunk stories <laughs> from AFN. You you hear a lot of good meetings, a lot of good contacts. It was a great time. But Kelsey, I mean, it sam- sounded like a slam dunk. Like she took your advice and went and actually was able to not only open some doors. I think if I recall right, she had eight meetings lined up beforehand, but then really parlayed that into mission success, which is ultimately getting it to that next level of funding and then the offers. Yeah. The, one of the key things when I first met her, I just like took her aside. I said, listen, you've done an amazing job. Like they raised a good chunk of money. And that's like one of the first conversations you and I had, which is it's not, you know, a problem. It's the problem. And mm-hmm. they solve like the problem because they had a chunk of money that she spent time raising the funds for. And I said, yeah. what that allows you to do is when you go to the American film market is that she has leverage. You know, I mean, you this is the, this is real deal, like money on the table. So that's mm-hmm. why when she started working with the casting director and then, you know, there's looking for ways in the budget to get the money to spend on the actors. And that just opened mm-hmm. one doorway after another doorway. And like I said, she, they actually, um, you know, they got the, the talent they needed and, and, and she created an environment that was a win-win situation for everybody involved. Um, but I think that's something for people going, well, I don't, you know, well, I didn't make, I didn't raise the money or how do I didn't, you know, I don't have that kind of money I didn't raise. So yeah. like, how do I, you know, deal with that? Well, um, you know, you got to start somewhere, I guess, you know, and there's uh, there's a lot of other ways to get sort of named actors onto your project. But th- this was like sort of the classic story of simply if you have enough funds, maybe just enough funds to hire a casting director just to get mm-hmm. the ball rolling. Um, because, you know, something that wasn't said it was th- th- there's this idea that you can actually like if you raise a little bit of money, you hire a casting director to at least get these conversations going. Because the script has to be solid so you can have these conversations going. And maybe if you have sort of like a promise letter or sort of like a letter of intent from an a investor that says, I'm not going to invest, but if you tell me that you can possibly get a certain actor or a certain list of actors onto your project, then I will commit. Because a lot of investors are wary of committing unless they know that you can bring something to the table. So yeah. if you raise a little bit of money to hire a casting director, then you can at least get the the ball rolling because maybe the letter of intent is just as good as maybe some money in you know the equity in in, the, in your funds, and that casting director might introduce you to some name actors and say all of a sudden you meet a name actor that says I really like this, this is fantastic you know um, then we you know I had to go to the next step which would bring it to the producing partners which is essentially the producing partner is the investor. And you bring the, the, you know, the clientele says we met with X amount of name actors or we had auditions for named actors. And um, these are the people that are interested in really wanting to do the film. Um, can we get, you know, the release of funds or the next step, you know, mm-hmm. so that that way you can still have meetings with investors by saying, like, look, let me do the legwork and prove to you that this project is something people want to do. And then like, okay, if you bring that or like maybe the investor says, if you can get this actor, because for whatever reason, their wife has the biggest, you know, you know, crush on them or they always wanted to be in a movie with that person. Like if you can do the legwork and you deliver that person to that investor, you know, then you might get the money. So that's one way to tackle it if you don't have really hardly any money, but maybe just enough money to hire a casting director. So. Yeah, that was definitely a nugget I took away was that you know, almost like proof of life she talked about is proof of funding. Yeah. Uh, I like starred that and asterisk. I thought that was pretty fascinating that your bank just sends over, you know, hey, look, they do have some money in the bank and it doesn't even need to be the full amount in escrow. It could be enough to say we're out the gate. You know, this is more than just an idea. And it was impressive that her casting director was immediately at lunch talking about who do you see in the film and boom she picks up the phone yeah and uh you know checks with the the actress manager and sure enough you know that's who she ends up getting uh that's impressive because when you're getting a casting director at the end of the day that's what you're paying for rolodex their relationship Mm -hmm. um so i know that the few that i've reached out to that's what i'm looking for another way that i've found it is 
if you go in not knowing exactly what actors you want, you might be able to get into a management group where they say, well, you know, we have access to these three or four actors and they kind of have an open season right now. Uh, Would you be interested in us pitching to them? So that's another way. If you're not so rigid on it's got to be these people, you let the management team kind of refer you to it and you can get your script read that way and get some attachment as well. That's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. You see that a lot. All right, cool. So for those who listen, I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation I had with Kelsey and uh, inspired too, like you said, but just nuts and bolts, you know, try to get some funding in place, some proof of funds, or if the, some letter of intent that somebody has a high net worth, you know, but they didn't, you know, commit like they're some kind of letter or agreement says, I will commit if you're able to deliver this, you know, actor or these actors, because that means that this project is legit. And then take some funds and go and get a casting director. That's sort of my biggest takeaway from that. Okay, cool. So let's jump into like a smaller field. Like say like if (laughs) now my next interview is with uh, Alyssa uh, Ronenbeck, who's an actress and a producer up here in Portland as well. And, you know, and um, what you... What's interesting is we, I, I was like, did we ever, because the circle of friends we have, we we seem to be, we all know, know, know the same people, but I don't remember actually meeting her. But then she reminded me that she did meet me at the premiere right. of my movie, The Cube. Yeah. But yeah. I was probably just in a haze, so I couldn't remember sure. it. Yeah, so uh, she was so delightful. But she's been working steadily as a producer up here in, in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, and she handles a lot of sort of, all types of ranges of productions. But what's interesting, I've seen her on smaller productions, but she handles, you know, SAG or dealing with SAG actors because there's a handful of SAG actors up here in Portland. And a lot of that is, I think, the fear for filmmakers or producers, like, well, how do I deal with the paperwork? Or, you know, what about all this, you know, kind of, you know, what's the nuts and bolts that I need to know? And so we're going to get into the second part of this interview or this episode, and you're going to listen to uh, my interview with Alyssa, and she's going to give us, um, you know, some 401 on exactly how to work with SAG on small pro- productions. So Yeah, let's dive in. All right, here we go. Let's listen in. So this podcast episode, it's, it's specific for helping independent filmmakers kind of deal with, well, how do I get named actors or how do I work with SAG? There's a lot of fear or unknown, especially when mm-hmm. people are dealing with such range of budgets. And I think it was really cool because seeing, you know, you've worked in that world where you've had to deal at least from the credits, it looks like you've had to deal with SAG to some extent to, to some of the projects, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, I've done a bunch of SAG stuff. Yeah. But you've also done stuff that's not SAG. So you, you mm-hmm. can, you've seen both worlds. So I'm going to sit back and just ask a, a simple question. What is the, what should an independent filmmaker know about when they are getting to that realm of like ultra low budget or new media or anything like that, where you, where you want to, work with an actor that maybe a local actor, but you know, they're SAG and you want to pay them their dues and not try to, you know, skimp the production because you're too cheap to like go out and just pay for the, the, the the talent and the service that they belong to. Yeah. Well, I think like the biggest misconception is, um, especially in the low budget world is that it's like super expensive to get SAG actors. That's, not necessarily true depending on the project you're doing if you're doing a commercial yes that can be super expensive but if you're doing something for the web um it's it's really just a fraction more than than what you would be paying your other actors um so they have some really great uh, adjustments out there for people like us and a lot of the stuff i've done where you can uh, get sag actors for pretty reasonable rates Um, it's going to be, I mean, your two biggest concerns is that you have to make sure that you're on a payroll system, which also seems terrifying to a lot of people in our world, but that's actually fairly simple as well. Um, and then you just have to make sure you budget for, um, the, the P and HBs, which go towards the actor's insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which is is right around 20%. What does that stand for again? P and HBs? Oh, it stands for something in health. Pension and health. Pension and health. Okay. That's yeah. just part of the uh, the union fees. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really just like one extra added cost. One. Yeah. You know? So it's really not that much. Um, and then once you do it once, you start to be like, oh, okay, I get it. I think 
from my perspective, after working with SAG on a bunch of different contracts, I've done new media, I've done feature films, I've done industrial, like the biggest thing is you just have to have patience. Like you have to have patience <laughs> and you're, you're going to hear a lot of different things from a lot of different SAG reps and you just kind of have to go with the flow and, and just work with whatever rep you're assigned. Um, the second biggest thing is make sure you give yourself enough lead time because the worst thing is trying to cram it in at the last minute. So don't do your casting and then be like, Oh wait, that person SAG, but we shoot next week. I need to get this SAG contract in. Like you're just setting yourself up. Like, What's for, how much, how much lead right. time are you talking about? Like, like say, say it's a short film. It's going to be from, you know, new, it's going to be online. You know, somebody's mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, we're going to hire this uh, SAG actor or SAG actors. And I have to submit the paperwork um, to SAG, the SAG office. How long of a response time should you give yourself? A month? I think a month is a good starting point. But I think the other miscon like you don't need to know everybody you're casting from day one of working on that SAG contract. You can get it all set up and then hire actors, fire actors, change actors, and then in the end, like it'll everything will kind of reconcile itself when you send in after the project's done with it, which is the, the final cast list, which is one of the last pieces. You ever in. Uh, so even if you don't know all the actors, if you know you've got one actor that is going to be SAG, you can go ahead and get that paperwork. Right. So when I talk about, I'm going to backtrack. The thing that you said not to be scared of is the payroll. Yeah. I mean, working with SAG, mm -hmm. you have to have a uh, payroll service. Um, what what services have you used that have like they're kind of like already plug and play? You just the additional service like how much money does an independent producer need to account for in terms of dealing with? All right, so now we need to make sure we schedule enough for this payroll service. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, it depends. I mean, there's a, a million options out there. Um, a good like smaller kind of company option, which I've used. Um for feature films and stuff before, and it's pretty simple, um, is Talent Services. They're based out of Washington. So um, they're pretty easy. You just say, hey, I've got this project going on. You think you guys can take on the payroll? Um, and then you send in, um, it's just your normal timesheets. You've probably seen them before if you've been on a job. Yeah. That's one a lot of people use. And then you send that to them, and then uh, they say, hey, here's the total. You send them the money and then they issue the checks to everybody. They keep track of all the record keeping. They send the W-2s out. Like they handle all of that tax paperwork and all the stuff you don't wanna deal with eight months from now when tax season comes around. Um, so it's it's essentially what's called a loan out company. Like when you're hiring people, talent services or whatever loan out company is actually hiring that person, um, you're just kind of the, the intermediary person. In Right, right. So w independent producers, like, you know, there's kind of this weird range of like, there's like this uber independent words that just people have equipment, they're trying to round people together and they're, mm -hmm. they're shooting, um, you know, on the weekends or what might, you know, wherever they can. Um, so when they're entering in the world of like SAG, there has to be a little bit of um, you know, business organization to some extent in terms mm -hmm. of... of making sure the budget's there, but understanding where the budget goes to to handle all these uh, entities in place. So it can't, it can't be, this won't work for a situation where, you know, me and Brad on the weekend, you know, it's like grabbing our, our camera and then trying to grab people together and we find out like or two of the people are SAG actors or something like that. We have to be more organized and planning and plotting to make sure that we... Um, you know, follow suit correctly if we go down this path, um, just mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think like some big things to consider, like the, the kind of basis for, can I make this a SAG project? Can I use these actors? Number one, do you have insurance? If you have insurance, then okay, we've got step one taken care of. Um, you're not going to get anywhere with SAG or a payroll company or anywhere if you don't have production insurance. So kind of, I would use that as a basis. And production well, insurance, if I recall, it's not like you might get like a million dollar coverage for production insurance, but the fee is somewhere as sometimes I think as small as like a hundred bucks a month. I don't remember. What what have you seen? Yeah. So, it, I mean, it depends. You can get production insurance that's just for a project um, or for like a whole year. Uh, if you're going to be doing multiple projects a year, it's 
usually far cheaper to go with the year um, option. And then uh, I've heard anywhere from like 100 to, you know, 200 $250 a month for production insurance. But that is going to cover, I mean, almost anything. You're getting a million dollars, which is the standard like mm-hmm. coverage insurance, which also means you can rent gear. Um, so if you need to call up one of the local group houses or Kerner camera and say, hey, I need this random piece, which I've done many times when I'm only ordering, like you don't have to be getting a whole grip truck. I just like, hey, gearhead, I need these three things. And, you know, but I still have to turn in insurance for that. So it so kind of, it does yeah. give you more options as well, but if you have insurance. Um, and it can be pretty affordable. Um, you know, either you can look online. Uh, insurance is another thing that takes patience because filling out the insurance paperwork I actually think that that's worse than filling out SAG paperwork. People talk about SAG paperwork nightmares, but <laughs> insurance, <laughs> insurance is, I feel like something no one understands. And you're just like throwing darts at a dartboard and you like hope something lands and then you just sign the paper when it comes back and you're like, okay, I have insurance now. Uh, Cause it's so, it's so complicated what different things cover and why and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. I know you that can do a whole other podcast on insurance. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I know that um, if you were shooting in your own home and you are not using SAG actors, or even if you are, sometimes you can actually. But mostly, if you're not, you can use your home owner's insurance to that actually covers you know for liability. It's basically mm-hmm. if somebody slips and falls or hurts themselves in your house, that's what your home ins- homeowner's insurance is, or sometimes renter's insurance is to right. to protect those weird circumstances and if you are making a movie in your house um for what i understand again we're not lawyers you may want to definitely check with your legal right. team but um in lieu of going out and buying like general liability or production insurance when you're out in different locations like if you know you're just working at your house you may look into what your home insurance or renter's insurance covers because it may actually take care of you um yeah, yeah. you just want to check your limits on your insurance to make sure that it's enough for whatever might happen and then the other side of that is you have to think about is if you have people like your friends or whatever are coming and your friend is bringing their red camera do you have enough insurance to cover that red camera if if someone drops it from the balcony you know that kind of thing mm-hmm. um, i'd hope you'd fire someone if they dropped a red camera <laughs> you never know <laughs> i'm sure there's so many there's way too many there's too many productions going on in this like uh this day and age with the all this equipment there's bound to be stories like that so oh yeah <laughs> is there any other things that indie producers should know like working in that world of like almost zero budget to a little bit of a budget and dealing with um you know the the ramifications or the the benefits or the you know or what to expect anything else that we might have not covered that we should have covered i mean the biggest thing is just make sure it, it's mostly paperwork which i know no one wants to do and that's not the fun part of filmmaking it's the horrible part of filmmaking <laughs> but if you can just get the paperwork down and do it once and get through it it will be a whole lot easier the next time um so make sure you have your actors sign in and out you know, when you're doing a SAG project, because it will make your life a lot easier when you have to turn all that paperwork in, um, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's really it, just making sure you keep accurate records and making sure you get the paperwork done and filled out and just then listen to your SAG rep. I mean, the biggest thing is that you, you get signed a SAG rep and then that person is gonna be kind of like your gateway to SAG. They're going to be the person that says yay or nay. They're going to be the person that says you did this right, you did this wrong. Sometimes you did this right could change from production to production based on who your SAG rep is. So it's really just a matter of being patient, being okay with filling out paperwork, and just giving yourself enough lead time. Yeah. You know, I mean, for those listening, a lot of – I'm we're kind of in that world where a lot of people are like – you know, they're running their own production company, they've got, um, or they're picking up jobs as PAs, or they, or some of them are actors, and they get, you know, cast in a job that's, you know, like union run, where they, they're used to like showing up and that to fill out all this paperwork. And, you know, they're handing mm-hmm. out all this paperwork to somebody, usually, it's like, um, on those bigger productions, like some PA that's working with other a whole, like the accounting staff and producing staff. So, 
when they are not when they're done with that job and they want to make their own small job they should you know try to remember what they did on the bigger jobs and just apply that <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know they've made it easier too with sag in the last like few years like for a new media contract you can do that all online which has made it you know so much simpler um I try to avoid calling SAG mm -hmm. <laughs> if at all possible because um, you never know who you're going to talk to and that person may have a different idea than your SAG rep. And like I said, the SAG rep is really the person that's kind of the gatekeeper. Um, so if you have to call anyone, try to get a hold of your SAG rep. Um, or if you find a good SAG rep, I've been known to call them about different productions too. So like I have kind of have a list of a couple of SAG reps that I know that I've worked with other times and I say, Hey, I have this question. Here's this, because no matter what, there's going to be some kind of weird question arise. I mean, that's kind of the nature of filmmaking, right? We're solving problems. No one else in the world knew existed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have that too, uh, trying to have a SAG contract. But I think you can just, be patient, limit your screaming at the screen, you'll, you'll be okay. <laughs> so that concludes my interview with Alyssa Roenbeck. Um, again, you, I'll leave all the links to how to get hold of her and connect with her in the uh, show notes. Um, I, oh gosh, I, hold on for a second. I totally forgot what episode this is going to be. Okay, this is going to be 138, episode 138. So look for filmtrooper.com forward slash 138, and that's where all the show notes will be. So... Ron, I mean, what was your impressions of the, the conversation we had? Any takeaways or questions you might have had? Yeah, you know, it's hard not to say that being an indie producer, that SAG, working with SAG is a little bit intimidating, um, especially filling out all the paperwork and all that stuff. I loved her calmness about it. And she <laughs> said, you know, have patience, have patience, just relax, have patience. They want to work with you. Those actors want to work. My uh, feature... Uh, Rise of the Fellowship is what it was released as, but the original title was called The Fellows Hip, Rise of the Gamers. Hmm. Uh, it was a little parody with Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I got, I didn't have a SAG, or I didn't have an A-lister in it, but I had the video game, the Lord of the Rings online video game, so that kind of served as my A-lister. Yeah. But I, I did go SAG with it, and so I did have to kind of work within the union scope, and so it was bringing back a lot of memories, and I think an invaluable point to, to note is there are payroll companies out there that will help you ensure that that you walk the financial line that you need to appropriately. You know, people are there to help you. And, and doing SAG, it can be a little intimidating to fill the paperwork out, but you are getting a, a reasonableness to expect that the actor has uh, reached a certain level, you know, that, that they're reaching some threshold. Uh, there, so you're getting some measure of talent, if you will. So yeah, no, it was it was a great interview. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually interviewed another producer who didn't come on because imagine if I, we had this video portion of it, it'd be like that scenario where they're all like in black and you have like a you know garbled voice, <laughs> and then we'd have a subtitle. But here's some of the other little tricks that um, this other producer was talking about. He goes, if you're working with, um, if you need to submit paperwork to SAG. And you, you can just, there's a thing that some producers do. We'll just submit a cast list of just the SAG actors and not include the non-SAG actors. Um, because um, he pointed out specifically, like, you know what? They, the whole motivation of SAG is they need to get as many members to sign up as possible. Because if members sign up, they pay a big fee to be part of the union. And the more you know, people that are paying those fees, the better it is for everyone in SAG in terms of pensions and salaries and things like that. So when you submit a cast sheet, a cast list to SAG, and it says, here's the two SAG actors and everybody else is not, um, they will keep those names of non-SAG actors in a database because um, if they come up again, they then can say, oh, listen, after two or three um, working stints on a SAG production, now you are basically um, required to join the union because you've done three union jobs, but you're only, you know, you're not union. So mm -hmm. some independent producers will get around that by not submitting um, 
you know, a cast list of the, the of you know, the non non SAG people. Now, the other flip side to it is that if you have a SAG actor who wants to be in your production, um, and up here in Portland, you know, sometimes it happens, or or smaller markets, you can essentially ask the SAG actor if they want to go FICOR, which is basically they are opting voluntary volunteering the option to not have voting rights and some other benefits of being SAG, but allows them to work on a non-union production without losing their SAG status. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, that might be controversial if like, you're working like in a, a hot market like Los Angeles or New York or so on. Or, but in these smaller markets, that actually might work okay, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's those interesting tidbits that, like I said, another producer, when I talked to him, like it r- remain nameless, but I'm sure those who worked with SAG have that sort of, um, um, you know, I guess workarounds. But I did notice yeah. that it was really interesting. Alyssa was talking about it's really important who you work with at SAG because it's they're all different. It's sort of like I guess trying to get a mortgage from a, a bank. You know, you know, at the different people you work with are not all the same. Some will give you amazing customer service, others don't. So. Uh, something to keep in mind if, um, why, if you're going down that path of having to do the paperwork and 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 be patient and try to find the good representative um, to help you with your project. Yeah, no, that's that that's a good word too because when I first did my project, uh, AFTRA and SAG were not unified yet. Yeah. So our office out here was actually an AFTRA office. And so they didn't have all the answers because I had a lot of questions because at the end of the day, you're the producer, you're responsible for all the things that you're signing. And Mm -hmm. SAG has like a Bible, you know, that they send you that you're kind of when you go SAG, you're agreeing to, to all these things. But one of the things that Alyssa said was at the end of the day in your line item for your budget, there's really one extra expense that you're kind of looking at. And I think she indicated it was insurance. So it's not like it's that crazy of an extra amount like you think once you go SAG, it's like, oh, my gosh, that's going to inflate my budget so much. And, you know, I only have, uh, you know, 50 grand to do my, yeah. <laughs> do my thing uh, for shooting and then another 50 for post or something. But, it, you know, I, I heed her point there that it, it was a good point that it's not that overwhelming and can be done. So I like that point, too. Yeah. Not be scared. I think if you're going to be professional, even the yeah. professional to small ranks, you know, go for it, you know. Um, you know, here's one, but you know, like for my situation, I made the cube is five hundred dollars without a crew. Now the thing is, is that most of all the everything was shot in my house, and so we had mm-hmm. homeowners, uh, homeowners or, and renters insurance, I guess. Yeah, you know, right. Depending, you could have both. You know, but um, if you ho- own the home, you have homeowners insurance. If you have re- renting, you have renters insurance. But there's a that actually covers the liability because that just protects anybody in your house that you know stumbles and falls on the concrete or tries to sue you. So that sort of if you're doing that kind of thing, there was insurance in place for that. Um, and then you know, and then we had a few scenes like out and about, but it was just myself and the lead actress. So you kind of take that that chance of like common sense, like oh wow, you know, this is you know yeah. that kind of thing. But um, yeah, so if you have a little bit of bigger production. It's not that much to get like liability or, you know, workers comps insurance, you know, it's a f- maybe a few hundred bucks for the production, you know, so it's like you said, it's not like thousands and thousands of dollars. So that's a good point, too. Well, hey, yeah. wow, this is the first time this is kind of a different format. I've never really done this before where I've included two separate interviews, you know, and then you and I bantering back and forth and uh, filling in some uh hopefully needed commentary on the on the situation. But I do hope that people get a lot of inf- value out of this one in, you know, or these burning questions like, well, how do I get a named actor and how do I work with SAG? And this is only part one. Part two goes into it, like I said, um, dealing with a work, my conversation with this um, New York um, film director who's been in any scene for a long time and has a lot of good stories about how to work with named actors and talent and then also listen to the uh, head of SAG Indy. So that'll be coming up in about a week or so. And um, so keep posted. In the meantime, where can people find you, Ron? Indiefilmcoach.com. That's kind of the easiest. And yeah, I'm, I'm there very much like a film trooper trying to help the filmmaking entrepreneur uh, really level up to that next level. 
Yeah. So if you want to get some one on one or some uh, ask some questions of Ron, uh, and you're on the East Coast, we're representing both coasts here. He's on the East side. Yeah, we are. And I'm on the West side. <laughs> Just go to uh, indiefilmcoach.com and uh, uh, chat up Ron when you can. And as for me, my thing, you guys, is don't go away empty-handed. Get something for free. Actually, if you go to filmtrooper.com, and um, you'll see up there in the menu section of filmtrooper.com, there's a little menu item called Me Members Portal. And it's, we just launched it. And if you click on that, it's free to everybody. You just have to enter your email, uh, name and email, and then you'll get access to this free Members Portal. So it's, it, it addresses like all these different different pain points we all have in the filmmaking process and hopefully you can find a lot of value out of the members portal um, again that's free to you just go to filmtrooper.com and that's all we got for t this uh this episode and I look forward to talking to everybody and seeing everybody or you know next time when we're out film trooper empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs